Okay, so first off, I guess you know, who are you? Uh, I am Everett. Is that it? Yeah. All right. All <laughs> the things you need to know about coffee. <laughs> I'm Everett. Uh, yeah. I work for Starbucks. I've worked for Starbucks for four years, which means uh, I have learned a lot about coffee. I used to be a touring musician. Uh, there's like a solid season of touring and then there's a few months where you just don't do anything because it's like nobody wants to pay for shows during a certain time of the year. It's weird but um, I was looking for a job to pick up hours in between touring and coffee shops are very flexible with their hours. So that's how I kind of got into coffee. I don't feel like it's common knowledge that coffee is actually a, it comes from a berry, like a fruit. Uh, on a small shrub. Um, this small shrub can grow up to 30 feet tall, uh, but we keep it pruned from five to six feet tall because it all has to be hand harvested. So anyway, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about uh, the anatomy of a coffee cherry. It's got a pretty uh, thick skin. The pulp, which is the cherry. That's the cherry, that's the good part. It tastes really sweet, actually. Mucilage, this is really fun, because it's not. It's snot, because the mucilage is like the a snotty yes. sort of... Yeah. Yeah, okay, all right, cool. It's a sweet, <laughs> sticky, honey-like substance that coats the bean. Uh, the parchment is a thin, white, you like paper, you know, papery sort of thing. Silver skin is a layer that uh, protects the bean. You hardly know it's there, to be honest with you. It just looks like you're looking at the bean, but you're actually looking at silver skin. And then under that is the green bean, which is... Uh, usually stored in those big burlap sacks for like up to five years before it even gets shipped over to the states before we roast it. So when it's green coffee state, this thing stays, uh, it stays uh, edible, I guess, for a very, very long time, as long as it's in a controlled, climate controlled um, hangar or something like that. They mix up your coffee Interesting. Yeah. So in circa AD, 800 to 900, there was a man by the name of Kaldi. He was a sheep herder who would herd sheep as per the job description. So we're in Africa, that's the scene. He noticed that one of his sheep uh, ate a berry off of a bush and started going haywire jumping off the plains. So he studied this and when he realized that the sheep didn't die at the end of the day, he said, well, man, let me pop one of those bad boys myself and see what happens. That's when caffeine was discovered. There was a monk that came by, knew called, he saw what was going on, took the berry, crushed it into powder, mixed it with water, which creates the first cup of coffee. He drinks it and discovers, holy heck, I'm very awake. Let me bring this back to my fellow monksters at the monastery. And the monks are like, holy guacamole, this stuff is a gift from God. Man, this stuff is helping us stay awake during long prayers. We need to share this with the world. This is amazing. And people thought that the monks like had special powers, it was crazy, it was, it was awesome, it was a great discovery. Circa 1000, Arabian traders brought coffee plants from the Red Sea to Yemen, otherwise known as Arabia. This is where it was first cultivated on plantations. They would boil these coffee beans and they called it ahwa, which basically means that of which prevents sleep, is what that translates to. In 1300, Muslims used to consume coffee bean broth because they believed it warded off evil. As Islam was spreading to North Africa, the Mediterranean, and Asia, so did coffee. However, the Arabs were smart about this. To prevent it from being grown elsewhere, they would boil those bad boys so that they couldn't be grown anywhere else other than Arabia. This changed when an Indian pilgrim, though, took an untreated bean, brought it out of the Mecca, and grew it elsewhere. That's where it began. That's where it all started. That's where it got popping. From 1450 to 1650, Ottoman Turks brought coffee to Constantinople. 
otherwise known as Istanbul. So this is where coffee houses began to spawn. And this is where men would socialize and drink hot black coffee. These coffee houses were not open for women. However, women would use coffee for medicinal purposes. And at the time, coffee was actually known as a huge aphrodisiac. If a husband wouldn't bring home the wife a reasonable amount of coffee to get that thing going, she could, under Turkish law, she could sue him for divorce. It was a huge requirement for the household. If a man didn't bring enough coffee home, he would lose his womb un, if you know what I mean. I know. <laughs> so from 1615 to 1700 in Italy, there was a Venetian merchant who fell in love with coffee uh, in Turkey. And so he brought it back to Italy to share with his, with his country. And this is where coffee houses started prospering in Europe. Between 1645 and 1655, coffee houses were spreading all over Italy. In 1652, they were spreading in London. And in 1672, they were spreading in Paris. In 1690, the Dutch smuggled coffee plants out of the Arab port of Mocha. So this made the Dutch the first to cultivate and transport coffee commercially. They first did this in Ceylon and then the East India colony of Java, which is where it gets its nickname. Hey! This would soon make Amsterdam the trading center of coffee. In 1727, the uh, France was very protective over their plan the coffee plantations in the New World. However, when the Brazilian Lieutenant Colonel Francisco de Melo Palheta, so Palheta went to go resolve a conflict in Guyana in Brazil and he got a little handsy with the French governor's wife. Infidelity, if you get my drift. <laughs> but as Pelheta was leaving, the wife gave him a going away gift and that included fertile coffee seeds. Those seeds caused Brazil to be the world's largest coffee producer. Uh, that country, man, they, they produce the most coffee you've ever seen. And this also was a huge marking point between making coffee accessible not only for the elites and not only known for the elites, but also for the common man as well. So in 1900, 1910, we have R.W. Hills who created the first vacuum package for coffee. So he removed the air that was in coffee bags. And even though this was wonderful for the consumer, for local coffee roasters or coffee roasters in general wasn't so great. And a lot of them had to close down because of it. And then we have Luigi Bezra who invented the first espresso machine. He did this because he, he wanted his workers to have shorter coffee breaks, hence, Luigi Bezra made the espresso machine. Now, I do wanna make note that it is called espresso. Yes, it is express coffee, that's what it is in quotations, express coffee, but it is called espresso for short. So 1900, the Germans discovered decaffeination. 1903, Ludwig Roselius and Carl Wimmer got a shipment of coffee from Nicaragua. Oh, it's Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Yes. <laughs> they got a shipment of coffee from Nicaragua. The shipment got soaked in salt water, but they realized when they brewed it, it didn't taste bad. It tasted decent. It removed a lot of the caffeination that was in the bean. They worked on this for a while. They developed new methods and could remove the caffeine from the bean using solvents and steam. Hence, Decaffeinated coffee. So 1901, soluble coffee was discovered in Japan by Satori Kato. This idea was advanced further by George Washington in 1906. No, not President George Washington. Which no, George didn't. Washington? The one that made instant coffee in 1906. <laughs> Anyway, George Washington in 1906 mass produced instant coffee. However, 
However, the sad face part about this is it didn't really have a lot of flavor. And in 1908, Dresden resident and housewife, Melita Bentz invented the coffee filter. So Melita Bentz wanted to brew coffee, but not have that bitterness. So she was just trying to find the right filter to use to filter out all of those grounds. She noticed that her son's school blotting paper was the perfect thing to use. So she used this paper, she put it in a cone, she poked holes at the bottom and poured the ground, put the grounds in and then put hot water and poured it over the grounds and it brewed the perfect cup of coffee without the grounds getting stuck in the the brewed coffee. So removing the bitterness from over brewing, she discovered the coffee filter. And even today, you can still buy um, coffee filters from Melita in her business Frau Benz, which is Lady Benz in German. In 1938, Brazil was producing lots of coffee, so much so that they had a surplus and reached out to the Swiss company Nestle to take a little bit off their hands. A man by the name Max Morgenthaler took this request, worked on it for seven years, and finally made the perfect instant coffee. And it also had a lot of the flavor that George Washington didn't have when he was making instant coffee. Max developed the first instant freeze-dried coffee, and this was known as Nestle Cafe. And Nestle Cafe was so popular in the armed forces in World War II that it became exclusive to the army. In 1956, thanks to commercial break advertising in US television, the whole Nestle Cafe craze stole tea thunder because it was quicker to brew this new instant coffee than it was to brew tea. This influenced tea companies to create tea bags to make tea brewing as fast as this new instant coffee brewing was. In 1945, espresso machines were mainly steam-based. This caused a bitter and burnt taste when the coffee was brewed. However, a man by the name of Sheila Gaggia try to create a machine that removed the steaming process. So Gaggia invented a machine that would use manually operated piston pumps and water to brew coffee at higher pressure and removing the steam process. And this is where we started noticing that espresso shots had a crema. There are three parts to an espresso shot. There's the heart, which is the bottom dark part. There's the middle lighter brown color called the body, and the top, the very light brown foam that sits on top of the shot is called the crema. And this was forming after the coffee was being brewed through this new machine that Gaggia had made. And this lever-operated piston is now the basis of the espresso machines we use today. So in 1966, a man by the name Alfred Peet, who was a coffee trader and taster and the son of a Dutch coffee roaster, is credited for bringing custom coffee roasting to America. He traveled the world tasting, trading coffee. His career took him to the United States where he discovered that the coffee here wasn't necessarily the best <laughs> tasting coffee he'd ever had. So he decided to develop on that a little more and created Pete's Coffee and Tea Company in Berkeley, California. Pete would mentor three men by the name Jerry Baldwin, Zev Siegel, and Gordon Bowker, and brought dark roasted coffee to Seattle, Washington. And later these three men would become the founders of Starbucks, the company that I work for and love. And they did this in 1971. Starbucks is named after the first mate in Herman Melville's Moby Dick, Starbuck. They did this because they wanted to honor the high seas and seafaring tradition of early coffee traders. That's why Starbucks is surrounded by the siren, the sea, the famous mermaid symbol, and it's simply just to honor how coffee was first traded. So that's the history of coffee. There you go. You, you, you learned a little bit of knowledge today. You learned a little bit of knowledge. You learned a latte. Bam. Bada boom, bada bing.